Your generous support makes this ministry possible. Thank you. Father, we, we do desire to come to you and to uh, learn your word, and especially when we come to subjects where Christians have uh, puzzled over them and differ, we pray that you would help us from trying to read our own thoughts or our own desires into your word, but that we would be uh, seeking to learn to hear from you. Uh, guide us in our time together today. We, we do look to you now in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, we're coming to the end of chapter 14, and today we're looking at the subject which we, which we briefly introduced at the end of last class, where Paul, specifically uh, in instructing the Corinthian church, says in verses 34 to 36 that the women are to be silent in the church. This is what he says. The women are to keep silent in the churches, for they are not permitted to speak, but are to subject themselves just as the law also says. If they desire to learn anything, let them ask their own husbands at home, for it is improper for a woman to speak in church. Was it from you that the word of God went, first went forth? Or has it come to you only? Now, what about this subject of women speaking in the church? At the end of last class, I said that there are, I would, I would say that there are three, broadly speaking, different positions. You have the feminist position, which says that uh, there is no difference between men and women uh, in their role in the home or in the church, and therefore anything that a man can do in the church, a woman should uh, be able also to do. And so they are going to uh, read these words and say that that really is not a command which is, uh, which is required of us today. You would have a, a second, second position, which is... Uh, uh, which is saying that the women may not speak uh, in a modified sense. There are some situations where a woman may speak in the church, but that she uh, is, by and large, not to be speaking in certain ways in the church. A third position would be the position that women are not to speak in the church uh, at all. Now, it is this third position that I really am going to argue for. And it is not really the majority position today. So let me first of all begin by saying uh, what some of my presuppositions are. All of us, all of us have presuppositions. Whenever we come to a, a subject or a passage of Scripture, there are things that we, that we assume. First of all, let me, mention, let me mention four presuppositions. When we come to this subject uh, of women speaking in the church, let me insist, first of all, women are not inferior to men. Now, I know that some of you women are saying amen to that, but that is really an important thing to, to state, when it comes to uh, women, Christian women, their, their standing, their position, their privilege, their importance before God is exactly the same as that of men. So uh, we do not, we, 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 we cannot imply in any position that we take any inferiority 
of women to men. And I say that because there are some who will insist that any difference of role, uh, any uh, subordination of men, of women to men, requires the idea of inferiority. And uh, I am insisting that, uh, that subordination does not imply in any way inf inferiority. Let me say a second presupposition. Uh, from the New Testament, the position uh, and ministry of women is a very important one and it is a very positive one. When, you, uh, when, when Paul is saying that women are to uh, be silent in the church, uh, he is not saying that women have no role or an import, unimportant role. The ministry of women as it is presented for us here in the New Testament is an important and positive one. So that's my second presupposition. Third presupposition is that the equality of persons, of a person, and uh, the position, the equality of men and women, does not preclude different roles or functions. Men and women can be equal and yet have different roles or have different functions. Equality does not preclude subordination. Now, do you know what the, you know what the proof of that is? That equality does not preclude subordination? You know what the proof is? We've already had it here in 1 Corinthians. Back in chapter 11, what does Paul say? He says that uh, the head of the woman is the man. The head of the man is what? The head of the man is Christ. The head of Christ is God. Is God, is God the Son equal to God the Father? Yes, he is. He says, he says, I and the Father are one. He says that, uh, that, that all should worship the Son just as they worship the Father. And so uh, there is an equality in the Godhead. And yet he is saying that within the Godhead even, there is a different role between the Father and the role of the Son so that the Son has uh, subjected himself uh, to God the Father and fulfills a different role. So equality of person does not preclude different roles and functions, including subordination. And then my fourth presupposition really relates to the scriptures and that is because the scriptures are inspired and authoritative, they do not contradict themselves. So one passage of scripture is not going to contradict another. Those are some of the things that uh, I, I would say are my presuppositions. Now when you talk about presuppositions, it doesn't mean that you can't discuss them and uh, that there is no evidence for them, yes. Those are things that I think that we can show from the, from the Bible themselves, but we're not going to try to do that now. What we want to do is look at this passage and see what it is saying. So first of all, remember the context. Paul is talking about uh, the proper order in the church. There was disorder in the church at, uh, at Corinth. There was, a dis there was disorder because of a misemphasis on certain spiritual gifts, less important spiritual gifts, and not as much emphasis on the most important spiritual gifts. So Paul says, in the church, 
All things are to be done for edification. That's one of the key words there. And all things are to be done decently and in order. And because of that principle of doing all things decently and in order, one of the things that uh, he says is that only one person is to speak at a time. Uh, there is a limit to the number of people who may prophesy or speak in tongues. And he says the women are to be silent in the church as we have read these, these verses. Now, a couple of ob observations about these verses. Look at verse 34. The women are to keep silent in the church for they're not permitted to speak. We've got those two words, silence, and the word speak. Now, first of all, those two words are very general. You know, if I tell you to be silent, that's a very general kind of term, and it's a very broad term at the same time. If I say, don't speak, then you know what speaking is. In other words, what I'm saying is that uh, these words are not to be restricted in a very specific and limiting way. Some people have said that the word speak uh, in Greek can mean to, to chatter or, or something like that. Well, uh, the fact that the word can be used for the chattering of, of birds or something like that in some context doesn't mean that this is the way it is used here. It is a very general kind of term. The Greek word is going to be meaning basically uh, what our English word, uh, silence and not speak, uh, is going to mean. Now, when Paul says, let the women be silent in the church, they're not permitted to speak, why does he say that? Why does he say that? What's the reason that he gives here? Notice, he says, uh, they are to be in subjection just as the law also says. So, he says here, the reason that they are not to speak is the principle of subordination or subjection. And the basis for the principle of subordination is what? The law. The Old Testament. Now, what does the Old Testament say? What do the scriptures say? Do the scriptures anywhere say that uh, women are to be silent? No. There is no verse that says that women are to be silent. When Paul is referring to just as the law says, he's not saying that the command for silence is the requirement of the law. He is saying that subjection, subordination, that is what the law is, uh, is, is teaching. Now, what's he referring to? I would suggest that from uh, other places, when Paul refers to this, he is referring to the original creation. He is referring to the, subordination, the subordinate role of women as God intended in the original creation. Now, that's what Paul refers to elsewhere. When you go back into chapter 11 and verses 7 to 9, man ought not to have his head covered since he's the image and glory of God. The woman is the glory of man. 
For man does not originate from the woman, but woman from man. What's he referring to? 11, uh, 7, 8, and 9, particularly verses 8 and 9. What is he referring to? The woman does not, uh, the man does not originate from the woman, but the woman from man. Adam and Eve, and the creation of Eve, right? And he says, man was not created for the woman's sake, but the woman for the man's sake. What is he saying? What did God say? It is not good for man to be alone. I will make him what? A helper. I will make him a helper who is uniquely suitable for him. The woman was created to assist and help and aid the man in the role that God had called him and created him for. So that is a that is a, the helper role is a subordinate role. And so this is what Paul is referring to there. He also is going to say the same thing or refer to creation in uh, 1 Timothy chapter 2. And uh, he says in, in, in 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 11 uh, that a woman must quietly receive instruction with entire submissiveness. I do not allow a woman to teach or exercise authority over a man, but to remain quiet for, this is the reason, it was Adam who was first created and then Eve. So he's referring to, to creation. Uh, the reason I'm insisting on that or emphasizing that is that this role, this role of subordination is not based upon the fall. It is based upon creation. Some people have said, yes, there was a subordination in the Old Testament that was based upon the fall, and you have it in Genesis 3.16, to the woman he said, I will greatly multiply your pain in childbirth. In pain you shall bring forth children, and your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. And so what they say is that uh, man and woman were created equal because of the fall. You have the husband ruling over the woman, and with redemption, that that ruling is no longer applicable. And just as we do not have any qualms about trying to alleviate the pain of childbirth, uh, so that ruling does not continue. Actually, Genesis 3.16 is, uh, is, uh, is, is not God's punishment for sin, but rather he is, uh, Genesis 3.16 is talking about the the corruption that will take place in the role of men and women, the proper role that we had in, that, that we just mentioned in Genesis 2, that will be corrupted and there will be that domineering kind of ruling uh, in the world as a result of, as a result of the fall. This is not God's uh, sanctioning this kind of domination and lordship of men over women, that is a corruption of, uh, of, the, of the proper role that God had created in the beginning. So, the, when Paul is saying, let the women be silent, it's because of the principle of subordination, which goes back to, to creation. Now, notice, notice, the basis for silence, the basis for not speaking, is not some specific cultural situation at Corinth. It is not because of uh, some, uh, some specific thing in, uh, in Corinth. It is rather because of the 
original creation of God. There is a, a type of uh, cultural approach to passages like this, which is very much in fashion today, which hypothetically reconstructs the situation at Corinth, the background of this passage, and says this is the reason why Paul requires silence. And then since we do not have that kind of a situation today, that requirement is no longer, is no longer valid. Now let me say that this is a, uh, uh, um, that this, this type of approach, for instance, um, some people have said, why does Paul say this? Why does Paul say this? Well, in the, in the Corinthian church, like the Jewish synagogue, the men sat on one side and the women sat on the other side. And so the women were disrupting the service, asking their questions. One author says that uh, uh, in Corinth, you had relatively uneducated women who were disrupting the, the service by asking uneducated questions. So that's one way uh, of saying that was the background. Or another person has said that, uh, that uh, there were two kinds of, of meetings in the church. There was a kind of open meeting where non-Christians were present, and uh, there was also a a, a meeting of the church that had only believers. And so in that open meeting where non-Christians were present, they would be offended by women speaking in the church. And so that is what Paul is, is referring to here. In other words, we have a, a, a speculative reconstruction of the background that is given to us as the reason for the teaching and uh, since that is not the background that we have today, then these verses really uh, do not apply to us. Now let me say, that kind of approach to Scripture, I think, is, is actually very dangerous. Um, uh, the reason, the reason that it is dangerous, look at what it does. First of all, it, it narrows the meaning of the text. Look at what Paul says there. Let the women keep silent. It's not permitted for them to speak. Those are general, that's a general statement. But in this, in this cultural approach, that general statement is narrowed to a very specific kind of situation. And where does that specific situation come from? It's all speculative. It's all speculative. There is nothing here in the context or in the book that would suggest that that is the specific background. It is not what the text says. And what it does is it speculates and postulates an alleged background in which there's no hint from the text. And as a result, or then it, then it so it, 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 it speculates on a supposed background. It ignores the specific reason that Paul gives in the text. Why does, it, why does he say the women are to be silent? because of what the law says, because of the principle of subordination. So it ignores that, it speculates on that, and as a result, it dismisses what the text actually says. I think that very type of hermeneutic is, is, very, is very dangerous. Actually, all, all Christian feminists in one way or another, use this kind of hermeneutic and this approach with all of the passages that speak of the different role 
of women and men, whether in the home or in the church. And what they do is use this to explain away passages of Scripture which are very clear in themselves. So be very careful of that kind of, of hermeneutic. Recognize it when you, when you see it, where a person will, will give you a background that's not in the text and uh, then say, uh, this text really does not apply to us. Not only is this done, done in those passages that, that, uh, that uh, relate to women, but that, and this is the reason I say that it can be so dangerous, is because it is then extended to other areas uh, where uh, the scripture is teaching something that people do not like. And let me give you another specific example. This is the approach that is yet used to deal with passages like Romans 1 and 1 Corinthians 6 and other passages in the Old Testament that have to do with homosexuality. There are, there are some that would, uh, there, there, there are at least seven passages of the, of the Bible that speak about homosexuality, and Paul says that it is sin, that it is, uh, it is contrary to nature, and what is then done is to construct a certain kind of background, uh, which is said to be uh, different from uh, uh, the general kind of statement here, and these passages are dismissed. So be very careful of that kind of a hermeneutic. For most of us, the question is not the uh, feminist kind of egalitarian position. For most of us, the uh, question when we look at a passage you like, let the women be silent, uh, it is not permitted them to speak. For most of us, the question is, what, to what extent is Paul saying that the women are to be silent? Now, let me, uh, let me just note several things. First of all, we've already said that the terms that Paul uses are general. Uh, be silent, not speak. When he adds a further note in verse 35, when he says don't speak, what does he add in verse 35? When I say don't speak, what do I mean? What's verse 35 say? Don't even, what? Ask questions. Don't even ask questions. Now, what's wrong with a question? Well, Paul says, that's what I mean when I say the women are not to, to speak in the, in the church. And then uh, thirdly, thirdly, do you remember the context of this chapter? What is the, what is the main subject? What, what two subjects is he talking about throughout the chapter? Prophecy and tongues. The gift of prophecy and the gift of tongues. If the context means anything, then shouldn't you recognize that Paul is saying that women are not to prophesy in the church and women are not to speak in tongues? in the church. In fact, in the very context, in the very, in the very section just before this, in verses 26 to 33, he mentions both prophecy and tongues, and he uses the same two words, silent, silence, and speak. He uses the same two words there for both prophecy and tongues. And then in the, in the verses following, verses 37 to 40, he also mentions tongues and prophecy. And he uses 
the same two words. Uh, silence and not speaking. Now, I think that this is, this is important in our, in our view of this passage and uh, our, our interpretation of it. Uh, of those that say that women are not to speak, there are really two, two viewpoints here. And it relates to our understanding of 1 Corinthians 11.5. Do you remember that verse? 1 Corinthians 11 is talking about what? Head coverings. And uh, Paul says it is a disgrace for a woman to what? With her head covered. 11.5? Pray and prophesy with her head covered. Uncovered. And then you come to 1 Corinthians 14, and he says the women are not to speak, that they are to remain silent. Now, when you look at those two passages, um, 11.5 talks about a woman praying or prophesied with her head uncovered, and it, he says that's a disgrace. What's the implication? Huh? If her head is covered, then isn't the implication is that, that it would be okay for her to pray or, or prophesy? And then when you come to, uh, to uh, uh, chapter 14, uh, he says uh, that they are, they are not to speak. Now, you notice, we have a tension here between these two passages. We have a tension. And when you have a tension between two passages, if this is inspired scripture, and it does not contradict, uh, one passage does not contradict the other, then you really have to, you have to look at one passage as primary and you interpret the other passage in the light of it, or you have to say that the second passage is primary and you interpret the first passage in the light of it. I think that's really your only, your only choice. And so we have here two, two different viewpoints. Viewpoint one looks at 1 Corinthians 11.5 as primary. That Paul in that passage is given permission for women to pray and prophesy in the church if their head is, if their head is covered. Covered. And if you take that as permission, then what do you do with verses 34 to 36? You have to qualify those words, be silent and not speak. And so, many would say that Paul is... Uh, is giving permission for women to pray or prophesy, but they may not speak authoritatively, they may not teach, they may not speak in that authoritative way. Praying and prophesying would be non-authoritative kind of speaking within the church. They do not violate the principle of subordination. So that would be view one. The second viewpoint, the second viewpoint would take 1 Corinthians 14 as primary, in which case uh, when Paul says that they are not to speak, uh, that means that they are not to speak at all. Now, let me say a couple of things about this second viewpoint. Uh, this is the viewpoint that I'm going to ar argue for. Uh, now, 
first of all, notice uh, the principal reason for silence Uh, is, just a, is just what that first viewpoint said, that it involves the women not speaking authoritatively in the church. Um, and in fact, when you come to 1 Timothy chapter 2, the verses that we just read, Paul said, um, I do not allow a woman to teach or exercise authority over a man but to remain quiet. So uh, both viewpoints agree on the principle behind this. Secondly, uh, both would agree that uh, silence is not absolute silence. Uh, what about congregational singing? Singing, yes, congregational singing. Uh, are the women to be silent when we're singing a song? Do you see what I'm saying? Uh, nobody would, would argue that women are silent when we're singing a song. Why? Because that does not have in any way uh, show uh, exercising authority over, over the man. Uh, what about praying and prophesying? Uh, is, do praying and prophesying involve authority or leading the congregation? See, that's, that's, the, that's, the, that's the assumption that is often, often made, that they do not involve authority or leading the con congregation. What do you do when you prophesy? We've talked about the definition of prophecy, haven't we? What, what's involved with prophesying? Prophets speak the revelation of God. Uh, what does Paul say in this passage? In verses 4 and 5, he who prophesies edifies the church. Uh, he says uh, in Ephesians 2.20 that the church is built on the foundation of his holy apostles and prophets. This is a foundational gift. When Paul lists at the end of chapter 12 the uh, order of importance of the spiritual gifts, what's first? Apostle. What's second? Prophet, third teacher. You notice that, uh, that the gift of prophecy is there below apostle, but ahead a, a of, of teaching. Uh, when a person is prophesying, how do you say that that is not authoritative speaking in the church? What happens in prayer? Uh, is not the person who is praying publicly, leading the congregation in prayer? What did we see here earlier in chapter 14? That if I pray publicly, what is your response intended to be? You say, amen, amen. Now why do you say amen? Because the person who has prayed publicly is leading the congregation in prayer. And furthermore, how can you say, how can you say that, uh, that prayer does not involve doctrinal teaching and authoritative teaching? Uh, when you look at Paul's prayers, look at Paul's prayer in Ephesians chapter 1, in verses 15 to 22, um, 15 to 23. That is one of the most rich sections doctrinally <laughs> that you will find in the Bible. Prayer can be doctrinal. So women praying and prophesying 
are leading the congregation. They are leading the congregation. And uh, so my first argument, the, my first argument to say that 1 Corinthians 14 is primary, is that praying and prophesying does involve leading. It does involve uh, a violation of this, of this principle of having authority. My second argument, we actually looked at this in more detail, but my, in, in chapter 11, my second argument is that chapter 11 and verse 5 does not give permission for women to pray and prophesy. It does not give permission. And I'm not going to go over that argument. Uh, just to summarize, first of all, he does not say women may do this. He does not specifically say that. Secondly, it is assumed, it is assumed that, that saying if they do this with their head uncovered, they are disgracing their head. It is assumed that the converse, if they had their head covered, uh, that they may do that. But that is, that is not a logical inference that a person can make, that we are allowed to make. The uh, third point, third point, that 11.5 does not give permission. What did we say the context of chapter 14 was? Two subjects, speaking in tongues and prophecy. That's in the whole chapter. And if the women are not to prophesy, if they're not to prophesy, which was a foundational gift, which was the second gift of in importance, which involved the uh, giving the revelation of God, uh, then the nature of the gift and the context of the passage would say, Paul is saying that women are not to prophesy in the church. But, do you see where it's going? See where we're going? If chapter 14 says that they are not to prophesy, then how can you go back to chapter 11 and verse 5 and say that is permission to prophesy? prophesy? You follow? But do you know what the next step is? If 11.5 does not give permission to prophesy, then it doesn't give permission to pray, right? So, <clears throat> remember, Paul is answering specific questions in Corinthians. And uh, when you look at chapter 11, women were speaking and they were doing so with their head uncovered. Uh, in chapter 11, he deals with the subject of head coverings, and in chapter 14, he deals with the subject of women speaking. But you may say, well, when Paul says in 11.5, a woman who prays or prophesies with her head uncovered disgraces her head, you may say, for her not to be able to speak at all, that's, that's a confusing statement. That's a confusing statement. That's, that's not logical. That's not logical. Why did he say it that way? <laughs> but remember, just because you would say it differently doesn't mean that you uh, can uh, can say that Paul must have done it or should have done it the way you would do it. We have to, we have to try to put these two together.
So my second argument is that, uh, that uh, 11.5 does not specifically give permission. Uh, pray and pr prayer and prophesy is a, an authoritative, leading kind of thing in the church. Uh, this is, this is uh, uh, 11.5 does not give permission. And then let me, let me ask you, what's the main subject dealt with in chapter 11? What's the main subject? Isn't it the subject of head covering? That's, that's what he continually is talking about in that chapter. In these verses, in verses 34 to 36, what is the main subject? Hmm? Women speaking. Now, if, if the main subject in, women's, in, in chapter 14 is women speaking, then shouldn't you put that, when it comes to the subject of speaking, as the main emphasis? You interpret chapter 11 in light of what is the main subject in chapter 14. That is the primary thing. Let me make one final observation on this, and that is when Paul says, let the women be silent, where? Where? What does it say? In the church. In the church. This is a restriction that particularly applies to the church it is not a restriction for all cases. In fact, when you look at the rest of the New Testament, there are clear examples of women prophesying, teaching, evangelizing in a non-church setting. Uh, Acts chapter 21 and verse 9, Philip's daughters were prophets, prophetesses. In uh, Titus 2 and verses 3 to 5, the older women are seen to be teaching the younger women. In uh, 2 Timothy 1.5, and chapter 3, verses 14 and 15, the women are seen to be teaching children. And it's not just other women, and it's not just children. When you come, when you come to uh, the book of Acts, Priscilla, along with her husband Aquila, took Apollos aside and taught him. And the fact that she is mentioned first may indicate that she was the leading one in, in teaching him. Paul also commends the ministries of women which were very significant and important in the work of the gospel uh, uh, in Philippians 4 and in Romans 16. What I'm saying is that this command for women to be silent and not to speak does not apply outside of the church.